The Sopranos, Ray Donovan, The Irishman, American Gangster. What American film actor has had a role in all four of these classics? It's my guest on Guys Guys Radio this evening, Robert Bobby Finero. It all begins on KCAA at 8 p.m. Pacific time here in Southern California, 102.3, 106.5 FM, 10.50 a.m. The pod drops worldwide tomorrow, and you can catch all the episodes of Guys Guys Radio on my new YouTube channel at Robert Manny. Guys, Guys TV, thanks for your support. It's Guys Guy Radio. Here's your host, Robert Manny. Welcome to Guys Guys Radio. This is your host, Robert Manny, welcoming you to the show where men and women can be at their best and everyone wins Guys Guys Radio. We're here to inform you, inspire you, empower you through the stories and journeys and teachings and insights, if you will, of our guests to help you think and feel and maybe even act, kind of add some value to your lives. I know you're getting bombarded with so much uh, toxic information from the mainstream media. We try to keep it light here and bring you information that could help you out in a practical way during your day-to-day lives. Now, sometimes I also like to bring in a guest who's just somebody of interest who we could have a fun discussion with, like a couple of guy, guys guys having a convo. And that's what we're doing this week. I recently spoke with an amazing guy. His name is Robert Fernero. He is a American stage, film, and television actor best known for his role of Eugene Pontecorvo in the Emmy Award-winning TV series The Sopranos. He's been on Broadway. He has worked in The Irishman with Martin Scorsese that had De Niro and Al Pacino and Joe Pesci in that, a recurring role with Ray Donovan as Lieutenant Bricker, and he's been in a lot of other stuff. And he's got a new cooking show that he's doing with Eat With online, and that's launching on September 3rd. So check it out. Robert Fernero. So what's going on? Well, we're at the end of the summer. This is the first summer where we've been wearing masks. So hopefully when we look back at 2021, we'll say, wow, that was a crazy year, 2020, and things are better now. Well, let's see what happens. So anyhow, I'm so glad we're here on Guys Guys Radio throughout that whole this whole situation that we've been experiencing together. And I hope you're staying safe. I hope your family's safe. And I hope you're showing respect for yourself and everybody else as we get into the fall season coming up. And I know we've got an election a couple of months away and tempers are flaring on both sides. And my friendly advice to everybody would be love and respect yourself, love and respect other people. Uh, When you have to choose, choose love, not fear, be kind. People are going to erupt. Crazy stuff's going on. Get a grip. Be the light that shines on the darkness that a lot of other people are putting out there. And I know it sounds a little sappy and sanctimonious, but it's the truth. Just we have to, each one of us has to be a good example. And the more good work that we do individually, the more it's going to have a ripple effect with everybody else. So that's how we roll here on Guys Guys Radio. And I'm excited about this week's show, and I'm excited about all the wonderful guests I have coming up this fall for you here on KCAA and on my podcast. So why don't we get ready to roll with Robert Fernero of The Sopranos. It's Guys Guy Radio. Okay, Guys Guys Radio, I have got a very special guest today. He's an actor, a working actor. His name is Robert Fanero. You probably know him. You've probably seen him. You may not be super familiar with his name, and I say that respectfully, but I guarantee you've seen him because he's worked with some of the top talents in the business and on some of the top uh, shows and films that have ever been done. No- number one, The Sopranos. So, Robert Fernero, let me tell you a little bit about him. He's a professional working actor. He's based in New York. He's known for his work as a regular on The Sopranos as Eugene Pontecorvo. And his most recent credits include The Irishman, directed by, of course, Martin Scorsese. He's he's got a recurring role in the new season of, uh, the last season of Ray Donovan, because I think uh, 
it's kind of, I don't know if it's hiatus or over, but we'll get into that. Other TV credits, regular on The Sinner with Jessica Biel. Vinyl, if you remember that one, that was a Mick Jagger, uh, Scorsese produced show about the music business. Um, some of his films, Not Fade Away with David Chase, the, uh, the creator of uh, The Sopranos. American Gangster, as you know, all about uh, Harlem drug law uh, with Ridley Scott directing. And he has a directing credit also, Robert, in a one-man show titled Space Cookie that was uh, with uh, stand-up comedian Mike Pacchetti at the 13th Street Repertory in NYC. He's also been on Blue Blood um, in the theater without paper, Squeak Car Named Desire in Europe. Also, Law and Order. I guarantee you know who he is when you see this. Welcome to Guys Guys Radio. Robert Fanero. I'm so honored that you're here with us. Robert, thank you so much. With that kind of opening, I just, it's hard to, it's hard to follow that. You know, thank well, you so we're going to talk about uh, Robert's career, and also he is going to start out on Eat With, uh, doing a whole cooking program, and it, a lot of it's obviously going to be based on some great Italian specialties. So me being an Italian American and Robert also will have lots to talk about. So let's start right at the beginning. Um, I listened to some interviews with you and read about you and you, you're a good guy. He's got a fan, you got a fantastic background. And like many people, you kind of, I don't want to say stumbled into the business, but you wanted to kind of get into finance. And then your uncle had a repertory company, I believe in, uh, in Brooklyn and things kind of came together and then you met James Gandolfini. So that's kind of the short story. Tell us how you got into the business, Robert. Well, Rob, uh, again, thank you for uh, all your kind words. And um, that's exactly how I got into the business, through my uncle. Uh, I got the bug from him because he was a priest, um, a Catholic priest in, the, uh, this, uh, in Brooklyn. And um, he started producing plays, uh, the, um, Grecian, uh, the Grecian Theater Company. And he went from there to Catholic Charities, raising funds. And he did Hello, Dolly, a lot, and, and, and a lot of great plays. And um, they were really professionally. He built the company from the ground level. Uh, he's a director. And uh, he built it from the ground level all the way up to uh, producing some really wonderful plays with some of the music, uh, some of the um, the composers had come down too. So he did it at Christ the King Church, and uh, that was his biggest venue. But he was real well respected within the community. In the theater community, also, you know, he did TV, he did some TV interviews and everything back then. It was really a big deal. So, I mean, he was the guy I looked up to as my mentor when it came to uh, plays and stuff like that. And that's how I really uh, um, grew a love in the theater of my heart. And uh, it grew into high school. and into uh, co uh eventually college I, you know i went to pace university as you did also you said you took some classes mm -hmm. and um uh, you know i went in for finance as i said i wanted to drive a big jaguar or, you know <laughs> and have all those nice things and you probably do out. now though right now you drive to jaguar and you didn't become <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> So it sounds like you were kind of in and out, you know, you had the dream and you were exposed to it by your uncle and then you kind of left it behind and then you went the pace and then you pulled out of there. And I think it was your mom who said, what do you, or your aunt, what do you really want to do? And you got the acting bug and then um, you ended up HB Studios. Yeah. Well, the thing was I uh, met someone at pace and I put everything, all the acting aside for a while and everything. And then when, like so many things, so many uh, crashes. You got to cut. You walk away for with mm -hmm. with something, and that romance crashed. And uh, I said, you know, I really want to. I when I started at Pace in drama, I want. I really want to finish and and put my whole heart into it. Just like I talk about the first ingredient in eat with is you got love in your heart. That's the first ingredient. You have to do something with love in your heart. So I said, I'm going to try to act with love in my heart, and I went to HB Studios. And, uh, and I started there with Herbert Berghoff, all the great uh, trainers there, Earl Hyman. Uh, I never did with Uta Ag Agen. Um, mm -hmm. She was kind of intimidating, but I did. Well, even Herbert was even more intimidating. So, <laughs> But that's where I had my um, a formal training. And, of course, from there, I uh, tried to do a play at Fairleigh Dickinson. And I was so – we did a thing with Paul Sorvino – uh, he, he formed a company up there, um, Paul Savina, Philly Dickinson, up there in um, Inglewood in New Jersey. Yep. And they had some understudies, and, the, and it was a great experience to be around him 
he didn't do Goodfellas yet, but you know, Paul, you know, had done had some mm-hmm. good, great success. And uh, he the, he had his thing with the understudy. We do a couple of productions, not for the audience, but for ourselves. And I was so confused after that. I said, you know what? I still don't know what I'm doing. So I met some guy, David Salmon, I'm a great man, God rest his soul, from the drama bookstore. Back then, you were able to go into a bookstore. You still can't go to the drama book. Of course, now you can't with the COVID. But it was, you know, you can talk to people and communicate with them. And David became my friend. And he said to me, look, um, I'm going to... I'm going to uh, fund you. I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to pay for a class for you with this, this cat named Bobby Lewis from the group theater. And, and you, I promise you, you're not going to be confused anymore. And he was so kind and charitable that I did this for a year with Bobby Lewis, or maybe two years with, uh, with Lewis. And it was a great experience, that whole group thing. And I wound up with Wynn Hamm and uh, uh, Sanford Meisner's, um, um, you know, was his mentor. So the group theater really spoke to me. And that's when I, Book the play in Europe with James Gandolfini. Now, prior to, uh, I don't know if it was after prior that. to that or after that, you were, um, okay, you did that and then you came back and then you were working at some clubs and stuff. But let's talk about the experience with meeting James Gandolfini. What was it like meeting him for the first time? Did you know who he was? Uh, no, no, it was just. He's just like uh, another working actor, another guy trying first, to make it. But this was our first paying job. I think it was James and mine first paying job in, in acting. And it was mm-hmm. a great experience. They would do these, these tours of Europe. This one was, they did Cuckoo's Nest in Germany. There was a, um, I forgot his name, the producer who produced American plays in Europe. It was great. Mm-hmm. So he was going to do A Streetcar Named Desire in Scandinavia. And we auditioned. We got the, we, we, we landed. I played Stanley. He played Mitch. And I still remember on 42nd Street Theater Row, we had a, our first rehearsal in one of those studios near the Lion right. Theater. Mm-hmm. And I still remember seeing James. He stood out. He was in a doorway. He was dressed like Mitch with the glasses <laughs> on, with the white shirt on. He was just beautiful. There was something about him that I said, this guy is interesting, you know. And, and we had this first experience, three months of, uh, 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 of getting paid in Dutch marks, getting paid, working as an actor. And some nights it was competitive. Some nights, you know, I was good. Some nights he was good. We had this competitiveness going on, and, and it was a great experience, our first professional experience, I so, think, for, for James, too. You know? well, what was it like hanging out with him? Because I'm sure you guys are over there, two Americans. You must have went out a little bit, right? Rob, it was crazy. It was crazy. <laughs> yeah. uh, James, I could tell you a few stories. <laughs> he, 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 we really had a good time. You know, but the, the, some of the things I like, for instance, one of the greatest, best experiences was going to Elsinore Castle, you know, in, De- in, in um, where was it? It was in Denmark. Um, and um, we had um, gone to the, on this tour. This is the place where Hamlet took place, you know, Elsinore. And uh, and they had this whole plaque, Shakespearean plaque and everything. And we went and they we went down into the. Uh, the bowels of this castle and there was these dungeon rooms and one of the dungeons, the tour guide was telling us, and then he would leave you. The tour guide was telling us that one of the dungeons torches was, it was shaped as uh, uh, like a triangle. And each week they would put a plate, a triangular plate and you would get smaller and smaller until you, this was a torture. Mm-hmm. So you went to the cor- the very, very corner. You would be like minuscule pushed in <sighs> and that would, and then you would, it was like horrible. Mm-hmm. So the tour guide left and I looked at James, he looked at me and my friend John Barone was there too. And James says, come on. I said, what do you mean? Come on. He takes the rope. <laughs> I want to go. I want to go to the tip. I want to go to the very tip. James, you're out of your mind. They're gonna throw us out over here. Now, come on, let's go. And this is where he took me. He took me to that place, and it was really being an actor. You can empathize with being there, you know, Rob. Mm-hmm. And um, and and this is this is James. He he. This was him with Sopranos. This was him in his life. He took these risks, and that's why I think he was such a great genius actor. And uh, after that, when you got back, I guess you uh, kind of left the business a little bit and were working, uh, I think you were a a bouncer. And he was also, I know, I think he worked at Private Eyes. Uh, Just a quick aside, I ran into him one time Uh after season one of The Sopranos. I was, uh, there's a place called the Gaslight Lounge in uh, kind of the uh, west uh, 
meatpacking district. And I went in, it was a Friday afternoon. I had just left a job that I had. And I went, I sat at the bar and then he came in a few minutes after and sat next to me. So it was just he and I at the bar. I knew who he was from the show, even though the show hadn't really blown up yet. And we sat and we talked for an hour or so. And he was a really interesting guy. And I could see how he could have, he wasn't Tony Soprano by any means, but I could see how he had the ability to draw what he needed to draw that, that he could be a great uh, dramatic presence. Um, So he got that gig and then you guys ran into each other or he came and got you to get you an audition. Is that how it worked? And you got on the Sopranos that way? What happened was, yeah, I, I went and worked at Caroline's. I started as a bouncer. I was the skinniest bouncer on Broadway. Mm-hmm. The comedian used to make fun of me. Look at that guy. It's because I was really, I was really pretty light, lightweight. But I had this height and I had mm-hmm. the Brooklyn attitude. So it all worked. And I always looked at it like, be a trickster crow, you know? Ah, yes. So anyway, so this is what I did. I, uh, I, I worked there and a friend of mine was gone. He went to some party and um, James was there. My friend Gordon Silva, he's still very close with Gordon. And Gordon went up to Jimmy and said, hey, this is the first year like you were talking about. If I was you, I would get a part for my, your friend, Bobby Fanaro. You work with him in Europe. You remember? And James said, Bobby, what's Bobby doing? And we had seen each other one time be in between. One time we had some drinks, me, John, and James at, in Hell's Kitchen at Rudy's, I think it was. That was that bar that, there, that, that famous bar, Rudy's, um, or not so infamous bar. Mm-hmm. So anyway, uh, James uh, said, where's Bobby working? And, and, and uh, Gordon said, you know, he's, he's a manager. At that time, I was a manager. He's managing the, uh, a comedy club, Caroline's on Broadway. So... One night I was going in and I went in and, and on Caroline's you walk down these this whole big right. stair steps. I'm of course sure you've been there. And um, at the bar, James is, is sitting at the bar having a drink. And I say, is that James? So I went up to James, what the hell are you doing here? You know, so I, I figured maybe he's doing something with the, because, you know, Sopranos is pretty big. It was like the second second year after the second year. And he said, I came for you. I said, what do you mean you came for me? Well, there's a part on the show. And. I like you for your, to audition. I can't promise you anything. I tried doing this before. It didn't work, but give it a shot. Georgian Walkins, uh, Christopher Walkins' wife, she's a casting director. She's right across the street and uh, from 50th Street. Uh, they're gonna get in touch with you, and that's how it happened for me. From my friend Gordon, who was a still good, a close friend of mine, who he really and James, we just hit it off, you know. Okay, uh, guys, guys, radio. My special guest is actor Robert Fanero. We're talking about his experience on The Sopranos. So you got into The Sopranos, and as I, if I read it correctly, you were being considered for the role of kind of Ralphie. That uh, I've, um, the name skips my mind. To who the other actor who got that? But um, who was it? Joe. Yes, uh, Joe Pantaloni, and uh, you then became this uh, character, Eugene Pontacorbo. Tell us about the uh, the process of working on the show. And it sounds like it was a very uh, familiar type of uh, uh, situation there where they really looked out, everybody from David Chase down looked out for each other and tried to slot everybody in the right roles and then give you a nice story and a character arc. And then uh, you got your new character. And then um, eventually it was a very memorable uh, episode where you took your life at the end so you wouldn't betray the code, if you will. I like the way you put that because a lot of people they say that I was a rat and stuff like that, but mm-hmm. I never, I never told on, I never ratted on James, and I like your take on that because it's Thank true. I, I think I uh, um, sacrificed everything for my family. That's even though what, even though the episode after Michael calls me a mutt and stuff like that, I never, I never looked at it like that. For me, it was just I'll make the sacrifice for them. Mm-hmm. And the world was, I mean, that everything was closing in on me and them is only. What was the working anyway, vibe like? What was the working well, vibe great. like? On the you know, look, here's the way it was, Rob. I landed the role of Ralph Sofredo, mm-hmm. and and um, and it was great. I had op- I had front credits, and uh, you know James asked me, uh, you know, this is a great thing. Are you up for it? It was my first television job. I never really worked professionally. It was a lot of work, but I was up for it and everything, and and I brought myself to it as best I can, but the chemistry between me and Jimmy just wasn't happening. I don't know. Maybe would, I'm a little bit as like Jimmy in a way. It just wasn't happening. Maybe our height or whatever. 
and they grayed my hair a little bit. They tried to, it mm-hmm. just wasn't happening. So David had to make a big choice and um, uh, he had to make a decision. And, and he said, you know, I don't think it's working out as, as Ralph. And do you want to stick with the show? Of course I want to stick with the show. Come on. You know what I mean? And I said, okay. And uh, they made this new character called Eugene. And I asked him what it was about, who he, who he was. And he said, well, look, we're going to make it up as we go along. And which is what they did a lot of the times, the writers, Robin and Mitch Burgess. And then, of course, Terry, the great Terry Winter. And, and, and that's how it happened for me. And, and everything progressed and progressed. I was in, in Ralphie's crew. But as an actor, it was really challenging. And, and you know, I would sit down with Jimmy and we'd talk about it. And, and uh, there are always challenges as an actor. It doesn't always go your way. And, I mean, of course... Um, I don't regret it because I do like, I mean, no one likes to hang themselves, but everybody really understands trying to get out from underneath what your, you know, your life and, uh, people can relate to that. And I really, I'm very thankful for Terry Winter for writing that particular script, Rob, because people remember me for the guy yes. that, and, mm-hmm. and for the guy that wanted to get out, but he, he wouldn't and let him out and they can identify yes. with that. Terrific performance. That's what acting's about. Thank you did you. a great job there. Um, what was, you know, everybody hears about, uh, you know, the Sopranos, everybody had a great time on the set and everybody gets along and you can't change any of David Chase's lines, unlike some of the directors, no improvisation. What was it like being on set and working with these other talents? Did you guys have any idea that this thing was going to last as long as it has and become part of our culture now? I tell you, I never, I never had any idea. Uh, Jimmy, Jimmy would say, "In five years, it's not going to matter after we do this." Five, and and look, it's it's mm-hmm. more than five years, yeah. and it's lasting. And of course, with the COVID nineteen, I've been seeing a lot of residual checks. People who haven't seen Sopranos, um, uh, my uh, I have nephews that or, or friends that you know, I checked out the show. You know, it was terrific. And there's new. It's like a whole new audience. I mean, in working with everyone, it, it, it was terrific. It was, everyone was just like, like everyone to tell you, it was a family. When someone got offed or whacked, we would have a party for them. Uh, John, Fu- uh, John F- uh, Fury, um, uh, Gigi Gaston, and we had, mm-hmm. a, we had, a, we had a, a, a go-away party for, you know, for him, and we threw something for him. And, uh, so it, it was just a wonderful experience all around, but I never had no idea of how people really do I love connect with it. Yeah. I mean, Sopranos, Con, all everything. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Now, do you guys uh, and and ladies too? Do do you guys stay in touch? I mean, is it is it something for the media, or is there some type of vibe going where you guys are all kind of connected? Well, you know, I think everyone uh, partners with people that they could communicate with. I'm 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 also I'm good friends with uh, Maureen Van Zant, uh, uh, Stevie's uh, Stevie mm-hmm. Van Zant's wife, I, and mm-hmm. I. I do uh, go to see him at the Underground Garage uh, concerts mm-hmm. and stuff like that. I listen to a serious XM radio show. I'm really a fan of his yes. and, mm-hmm. and Maureen and, and their friends and his family and, and also Vinny Pastor. And, and so sure. Vinny had a, a theater company with Maureen and we call it the Renegade Theater Company. And I'm part of the Renegade Theater Company. We're going to be doing a Zoom with uh, the play called Closer uh, in the coming in the coming weeks, so they can check that out on my Facebook page, people. But anyway, we all have these little uh, clicks, you might say. And mm-hmm. uh, I know Michael and Steve are doing a a, a show by show uh, a, a podcast, right? And so is Drea and her friend are doing the puck. So you know, we all mm-hmm. kind of keep in touch and everything. You know, I mean. From there, uh, Robert, um, you yeah. got into the movie. You worked with another big director, um, Ridley Scott, American Gangster. I remember you were part of Josh Brolin's kind of bad cop team. Tell us about how you got the role and what was it like working with Ridley Scott and Josh Brolin and Denzel. The director wants you to walk on water. <laughs> <laughs> the first day on set. Well, actually, it was the second day on set. First day on set, they, they called me up. Really wants to see you. Wants you in, on the set. Well, I, I, you know, I wasn't told. Don't worry about it. just, just get over to the set. So that was fantastic. I got a day, you know, to get meet the Josh Brolin and meet Ridley. It was, and you know, of course, Gladiator. You're like intimidated and everything. Just put your at ease. But the second day, we had this scene that we we're picking up some drugs in this because uh, we played the SIU cops, bad cops, and. Mm-hmm. I was noticing, like, on the outdoor scenes that first day, Ridley loves, like, wetting the streets. He's wetting the streets. He's like, what are you doing? 
we're in this school or something like that, and it's supposed to be, you know, a police, a police station, and we're going to pick up some drugs from the uh, evidence room. Mm-hmm. And we do the scene once, we do it twice, and all of a sudden I hear, it's not going right. Uh, Ridley's going to, wants to mop the floors. He wants to wet it all down. So, okay. So he wet the floor down, and he calls action, and me, Josh, and Chris Nunzio, we're trying to walk on this wet floor. We can't even walk. It. Our shoes are like, you know, it's like right. just slipping all over the place. And I'm saying, look at this guy. He wants us to walk on water, literally, you know. Mm-hmm. And well, we did it, you know, we did it. And he was laughing at us, you know. And then all of a sudden, Josh says, you know, we got to get rubber, put like rubber on our shoes, get that done. We got to get the, the Josh. It's not going to matter. It's. <laughs> Mm-hmm. We're probably not going to do another scene inside with those wet floors. But anyway, it was a great experience meeting Josh Brolin and the whole thing, you know. Uh, okay, then you actually got into most recently. Well, let's, let's, let's talk about some other TV work that you did. Ray Donovan, great show. And you played uh, the police captain in kind of the latter seasons. Um, tell us about that experience, because that was also after Sopranos, my favorite show. Uh, I really think well-written. And I like the way the, the, the show kind of, uh, the story kind of shifted when they did the move from L.A. to New York and really interesting characters on there. What was it like working with uh, Lee Schreiber and the rest of, John Voight and the rest of the crew? I had one day with Lee, um, and, um, but mostly I, I was working with uh, Quincy Tyler Bernstein. She's a wonderful mm-hmm. actress. And because uh, she was the new uh, addition to the uh, to the uh, to the show, right? And what I heard was my casting was a little bit late. Is that the writers weren't really? Um, they thought that she should need she needed a few more obstacles to get to the bottom of Ray Don. You know, get to try to bring it Donovan in. Find those dead bodies, right? Find yeah, those heads so, in the river. So it was a little bit too easy for us. So they would throw a little bit of a wrench in there. So I was the wrench. And a lot of times, I don't know, I have to say that this is what happens, you know, this is whole casting. It's just a lot of times it, it, I, I, uh, I go in for these things and last minute things and I land them. And um, I landed that role and um, I knew what it was. He was a, a corrupt uh, detective, you know, chief. Um, and um, it was a really a great experience. Another great crew. Of course, I worked with Lee one day. We didn't have a lot to do together, so... Um, but it, uh, with Quincy and, and everyone else, Fadi, who played Quincy's uh, right-hand person, mm-hmm. it was uh, it was terrific to be on the show. Now, I, I think I really wasn't an avid follower of it, but then I started, you know, of course, you're in the show, you want to, you, you, like you were saying, you love them. And I said, well, this is great because you can actually, Ray Donovan does everything you have in the back of your brain that you would like to do to someone. <laughs> exactly. You know I mean? And I said, I love it. You know, it's good. This is good, man. And I thought digging it, you know. So uh, was the experience of working on Ray Donovan versus Sopranos in terms of working with the directors, uh, getting your, uh, the scripts, how the, how the actually workflow went. Just for our listeners, is there every project completely different in how it works or are there mostly consistencies in how the business is executed? Um, I think, the, you know, for television, it, it all depends on, on, who you, on who you're really working with. You know what I mean? The, the Sopranos, they were a stickler about don't change any of the lines. And uh, uh, on, on Donovan, they were, they were somewhat like that also. I mean, the television writers, they like to keep what they, they – and, and I can understand that. But, you know, I'll, I'll just, you know, compare that to working with Martin Scorsese, um, who I did vinyl – and uh, the first thing when I did with him was with vinyl, uh, with, uh, with Bobby Carnaval and right. Ray Romano and, and Almond Garrow, who played uh, Colosso. Um, working with, with Marty, there was a sense of, um, he'll always tell you at the end, okay, now do one your way. Do one, don't worry about the, the dialogue, just do what you feel to improvise. You re- I really got a sense of what it really meant to be like a jazz you know, and, you know, to compare it to jazz, to riff off that motif, that feeling or that want or that intention you have as an act, as a, a character through yourself to transcend that, send that. And I got a chance to really do it in the Irish and because the take that me and De, or Bobby De Niro, uh, Robert, we did together, that really was the one that Marty said, okay, now do what you want. I don't care. Anything you want, Bobby, go ahead. Uh, just... Throw it away, everything, and and that was a lot of the, a lot of that was 
uh, filtered through me. I, I created some of that dialogue. I'm not taking, I'm not taking anything away from Steve Zaley, <laughs> the great gladiator writer, and he wrote a great Irish, the script was great, a great screenwriter. But Marty has that way of bringing the best out of you, and that was, okay. I really love work, well, love working that way. All right, Robert Manny here with Robert Fernero on Guys Guys Radio. We're talking about his acting career. We're gonna get into some food issues in a few minutes, but let's talk about the, the Irishman, because that's your most recent uh, big, big, big role um, in terms of big film. What was, how did you get that part? And uh, the part uh, for our listeners is uh, you helped get De Niro's character kind of into running product for the mob. Was that it? I initiated him into yeah. the, into the, into the, into the group. Yes. At the friendly lounge, you know, and it's really, it's a really true lounge in, in Philadelphia, kind of like Johnny friendly from on the waterfront. It's mm -hmm. kind of like that. So, I mean, that, I, you know, that was, um, how did, it come to, how did it come to you, Robert? How did you get that uh, opportunity okay, that, to audition? I'll, I'll you, I was doing Sinner with uh, Jessica Biel and mm -hmm. Chris Mason, and me and Chris were talking, and, and they had, were casting, they had thought casting for uh, Irishman, and it was like, oh, it was basically over. They were going to start mm -hmm. and, uh, doing it, and, and this was a year prior. So <laughs> um, I said to Chris, yeah, have you get an audition? And he said, nah, I, I, did you? I said, nah, I didn't get anything. I said, that, that's it. Probably it's, it's over with. And, and all of a sudden, my former manager, he passed away, God rest his soul, Eric Faber, he calls me up and says, uh, about six or seven months later, it says, when they started shooting, and, and of course, everything, the casting was done already. And he says to me, uh, there's a role that they're looking for in The Irishman. You want to, you know, Johnny Friendly Lounge, and you want to, of course, yes. I mean, I'll go in. I, I thought it was, I wasn't going to get it. You know what I mean? I thought it was over with. And I apparently... I went in and I found out that this was a role that a lot of people, I would talk to, oh yeah, I auditioned for that. I, I used it. They, they, they brought me in. They told me I wasn't going to do the, going to do that part, but they brought me in to do, to do those lines. And I guess this was the, I forgot, they call it in, in audition circles, that one scene that they try to, ch Marty checks everyone out, well, you do this scene. And he, he kind of like a, like a painter, he paints, and he, and he paints, for, but that was the scene. So I got that scene that everyone did. And I was just like elated just to get in. Mm -hmm. you know, and, and to work with Robert De Niro. And of course, Marty, you know, we, he, it was a small s scene. And all of a sudden, uh, come in today, come in today. I'm going to think about, it. in a couple of days, I was called in. They didn't use, he didn't use me, but it was just fantastic to just be around there and be around Romano, Ray Romano, of course, Bobby, Connor Valen, Joe Pesci, and of course, De Niro. It was, it was a terrific experience. Uh, is there like a hierarchy on the set in a, in a Scorsese movie where you have like a De Niro and a Pacino and guys like that, Pesci, um, are they good guys to hang with, to work with? Is there, do they get special treatment or whatever? And I'm not saying that in a disrespectful way. I'm just curious because I, every job I've had, you know, the superstars get treated a little bit differently, but they could be great guys. Well, you know, there, there is, it's like Sopranos. I mean, Jimmy was a regular guy to everyone. I mean, that was the great, he was the greatest, uh, was a man of humility. And he was able to put everyone at ease, no matter if he had one line, he'd put you at ease because he would kind of laugh at the ridiculousness of the seriousness because it, mm -hmm. it is kind of ridiculous to take it all to, so serious. Um, and you know as well as I, you've worked on the set. There is a hierarchy, but I think that with Martin Scorsese um, and Marty, he creates a set just like The Sopranos where it's a family and everyone is basically... Uh, you might have a bigger trailer or whatever like that, but when you're on set, it's all this collaborative thing, and uh, you don't really feel it. You know what I mean? I, I never really felt that 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 kind of separation because you might say it's one thing that that really he he'll use it. Mm -hmm. You know he he you know so he gives you that freedom. To like, oh, if that's good enough, I like that sound. Keep it. You know what I mean? Now, you've been in TV, uh, film, and, and theater. And one of the things I've noticed, maybe I'm wrong, but some, some actors, they seem um, like to fit the big screen visually better than other actors. And I would say you're one of those. Like when you're in a big screen, like in The Irishman, you're noticeable. And not because of your physical stature, because of your presence as a talent. Um, have you found that? And is that part of the, the business lingo where, you know, this is a theater actor, this is a TV actor, this is a film actor, and that, that some of them can, uh, you know, cross cultural and others can't? I think, I think so. I, I think that's very true. 
um, um, if you look at some actors that really can make that transition, I, I you know, I, I have to say, honestly, I, I'm the most comfortable in the theater for some reason. It's just, there's a comfortability to it. Maybe it's the, the sense of, of wanting to know. And in, in film, there's always the unknown. And when you're working with a Scorsese, uh, he wants to see the unknown. He wants to leave you that leeway to see the unknown. So that's a little bit uncharted territory, but, um, uh, you know, the thing is with, with, with TV and film, uh, it's, it's like, well, like if I was to talk about like members only, mm -hmm. I was able to just put a lot of myself into that. And there's no greater thing than you can, you know, than you can, you can kind of, um, tr uh, um, mm -hmm. transcend yourself into that role. I mean, and, and it that was Eugene on the Sopranos for our list. Yeah, right? Eugene. So, I mean, yes. Um, you know what I'm saying, Rob? So, mm -hmm. Um, it has that, you know, there's a lot of, well, there's some roles that you feel kind of foreign to and you're just going through the numbers and everything like that. But then every once in a while, you get something that really hits you and uh, it's, a, it's a great ex experience. But I think it's true what you're saying. There is a theater and TV and film and, you know, I mean, it's, there's good people who are good at all, all three. Yep, some people just true. like working in one medium. It's true. So you're, uh, you know, you have a, you're an East Coast guy. You're like myself, Italian American. You've got the, you know, you've got the look. You're a big, strong guy. You've been in a lot of cop shows. You've been on The Sopranos, American Gangster, Irishman. Do you? I mean, I gotta assume, and I say this respectfully, that sometimes you might get typecast. Do you care? Does it matter? Would do you want to do guys and dolls, or, or where are you right now in terms of where your mindset is in terms of the type of things you want to do? Well, you know, I, I mean, I went in just recently to the first Echo cast I did. This is the virtual um, auditions, and I was uh, submitted for um, an American Indian, but a Mexican, you know, mm -hmm. looks Mexican. Cool. And I gave it a shot, you know what I mean? I, think, I don't think the first time you look at me, you think, even though I kind of slick my head back, try to do it, um, you don't look at me and say, oh, that guy's Mexican. So I, I kind of felt like I wasn't right for it, but... It's always great to uh, stretch that, um, you know, and to do other roles, you know, especially in the theater and also on film, too. I mean, it, it is to be typecast like that is uh, I, I don't enjoy it. You know, I, I think uh, with James, he was able to uh, break free from that. He because did. Of the, because of, you know, people would say, well, it's Jamie and James is going to play the, that special on Channel 13 and that he did about that, uh, I think it was that psychiatrist. And he did Romantic Lead, too, with Julia yes. Roberts. He was yes, good. He did. So the thing is, is that, yeah, I'd, I'd, love, I'd love to do it if I was offered it. I mean, it's kind of it's kind of hard in that sense that you need to make the money at the same time. Right. You know, you'd like to mm -hmm. be considered for sure. some other things, too. You know, Rob? It's like every career is like that, Robert. It's like if you're in advertising and you work, like I worked on some distilled spirits, and I, oh, every call I got was to work on that. And they don't, they, everybody wants to specialize everybody in this world. So that's just the way it is. Let's, let's move yeah. to uh, your new cooking venture. Now, Eat With is a website, and you're going to start on September 3rd, I believe, um, with uh, Sunday sauce. And uh, tell us about your love of cooking, uh, where you got it. it. Was it your mom, your grandmother, or your dad, or whatever? And um, how you, uh, your love of cooking, and then the types of recipes you're going to tackle and teach us. I love to eat so much that <laughs> <laughs> I got an operation on my stomach. They took out my large <laughs> intestine. <laughs> they took it from me, but I'm okay. <laughs> Good. Good. That's how bad it is. You know, I mean, we've had stomach problems as family because we love to eat. <laughs> yeah. I'm with but you. anyway, I mean, growing up in an Italian family, Grandma Camella, she'd make the Sunday sauce. And, and then my mom, you know, she would make her particular, each, each person's sauce or gravy, whatever you want to call it. I like them both. You know, I'm not going to mm. argue with you. Um, I mean, I've always been a, a lover of food and, and the different recipes. And, so, and I'm kind of uh, regret, I re do regret uh, getting, writing down some of my grandmother's and from those, uh, and some of my relatives in Long Island, some of their recipes that passed on already. So, I mean, we've been lost for our, forever. But in Eat With, uh, I get a chance to share those recipes with the world. And I think they're really easy recipes. They're not so difficult. Because like, I wanted to make dishes that, or design dishes that, you know, you can make, you know, it doesn't take very long to make, make it. Except the Sunday sauce probably takes about a half hour to put on. But it's not, and you've got to do some chopping and everything. It's not that you want to do it every day. 
but uh, these are great things. And, and my love of food from uh, uh, even General Sal's chicken, I, I make that also. <laughs> I know I got a bad rep as of late, but. That's not an easy dish to make, so uh, to make it right, yeah. He's, he's mirroring a mask, you know. <laughs> so uh, the secret to your sauce, what, what do you use as a sweetener, if anything? Do you use a little sugar, some carrots, or, or what? How, how do you make your tomato sauce? Well, that's a Sicilian tradition. I know Clemenza does it in The Godfather. And I, you know what? I, I did it for a while after watching The Godfather. It's mm -hmm. like being an actor. You see an actor and you kind of walk out of the theater. I can be Tom Hagen. I can be Michael in this situation. So, I mean, I don't, to sweeten the sauce, I suppose it's the onions that sweetens it, the caramelized onions that I use, which is what Frankie did with, with the Rayo sauce. I do Once I do the meatballs, I do... While I'm doing the meatballs, I, I do about a, about a, not too much onion, like in Goodfellas, not too much onion, okay? Yeah. Um, do you put the uh, meatballs, do you cook the, meatball, the meatballs in the sauce, Robert? They do cook in the or sauce. Or do you they're braise seared. them and then put them in, or how do you they're do it? Bra braised, like the traditional braise. Well, mm -hmm. some, people, some people put them in like that, but I braise mine, a quick braise, and because uh, I get the oil nice and hot. And I braise them at the same time. I put them back and when, and when, they, when they're braised on all the sides and they're raw in the middle. And, um, of course, then I do my onions and I, I throw that oil out. I, I drain the oil and I put the onions in the back on the, in, the, in the cast iron pan. I got a nice black, well-weathered cast iron pan. And I draw the, a little bit of water in there and draw with the onions to draw that whole thing. And I put that in the sauce. And it's gives it a nice taste and I think to, to sweeten it that, that I don't put any wine in it mine it's mom has never put wine in it so there are a couple of secrets that I will give you everyone I won't be like grandma Camilla she, <laughs> left, she left out a couple of them now <laughs> <Never> uh, <laughs> okay guys guys radio uh, our special guest is Robert Fernero from uh, his friends and my friends at the Andrew Frank group give us uh, kind of your go-to your signature Italian dish Robert there, you know what? There are so many, but the Sunday sauce, I suppose I enjoy that the best with some gavadil and ricotta uh, and, uh, and the meatball. I, I guess I enjoy the, the Sunday sauce the best. I mean, there are all the more things like the shrimp oreganato that I make and, and, and a lot of different, uh, uh, even the pizza macaronis, which is a really common uh, uh, Neapolitan dish that's, mm -hmm. Sometimes it's, about, better than a, it's better than a steak. How oh. about uh, shrimp parmesan? Do you believe in putting cheese on the seafood if it's an Italian dish like that? I, no, I, I, I do. I, I'm not a big shrimp parmesan guy. I, I have had it. You know, uh, they do a great shrimp parmesan at L and B in Brooklyn. Uh, I'm not an avid lover of that, but uh, the right shrimp parmesan, I'll, I'll do it. I do more of a chicken parmesan or eggplant parmesan, which I'm going to do an eggplant. Uh, and I put a little ricotta in my, on the layers of my eggplant uh, parmesan. How, how do you slice your eggplant? I'm a, I'm a big lover of eggplant parmesan. What's the, what's the key to that dish? Well, the, uh, the big key to that dish, Robert, is, is getting the small eggplants. That's a key. Oh, okay. The larger the eggplants, the more seeds they have, the larger seeds, they have a different taste. So you want to you look in the market for smaller eggplants, not the thin, long, thin ones, but really, they're premature eggplants that are not allowed to grow, you know, grow bigger. And those are the best ones to get. You, slice, you peel them and you slice them across, uh, not too thick, not too thin, in between. I would say about, about a quarter of an inch or maybe a little bit more than a quarter, about a quarter, a little bit more than a quarter of an inch. Of course, it's breaded eggs, breadcrumbs, and fried in hot oil, vegetable oil I like to use, you know. But that's my secret to the eggplant. The, the, I do like to get the smaller eggplants and, of course, the other ingredients also. I mean, everyone makes it. How general. about uh, you make oh, gnocchi, gnocchi, uh, gnocchi from hand, by hand? I don't do any of the pastas by hand, not yet. Um, oh, the cavadilla, my grandmother used to do the cavadilla. See, these are things she, she left mm -hmm. and she right. never wrote them down. I never thought I would. I mean, this, I mean I've cooked before, but with the, with the crisis, the pandemic, Right. I've, I've uh, like many people have have turned to other other outlets in order to keep let, my sanity. So Italian let, let, cooking. <laughs> let's let's talk about that a little bit. The uh, the COVID for a second because you have a lot of credits coming up. Uh, I was on the website and I see you have a lot of things that kind of in either pre production or post production, or whatever. But how has uh, the COVID affected the business? When do you think you'll be back up filming and um, 
What do you think are the long-lasting ramifications, if any, for the business itself? Fewer productions, more smaller productions, web productions. What, what do you think is going to happen with the business? Because everything's changing in every business. I guess it, you know, Robert. I guess it all depends on on the uh, how 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 comfortable people are getting together. One of the things about being comfortable is having some sort of vaccine that that people would. I think the vaccine is the, is the real game changer. Once that is like, and we can treat this this pandemic like a flu and we can get it under control, things will go back to normal the way they were. But until then, it's going to be a very controlled uh, thing. I mean, I have a friend, a good friend of mine, Rob Cloessy, who's on Blue Bloods. He's got a great part with uh, Tom Selleck, who I worked on too, great people. Right. And he told me that they're, they've been, you know, green lighted for this year, but they just don't have a time frame right, right now. I'm going to assume that it's going to happen in November. The production companies are being very careful about, uh, they're zoning, the unions are zoning, they're keeping people safe. But I think the biggest thing, and it's, and it's kind of shown itself, it's ugly face in sports, is how just the other last week when the Mets couldn't play the Yankees last weekend right. because two of the players or two of the people mm -hmm. involved had COVID. So, I mean, if you're going to be producing and you've got to stop, you know as well as I how much it costs to, uh, to stop production for one or two days, it's a lot of money. And the insurance company's got to work that out too. Right. There's got to be things. So, you know, it's, not, it's going to take some time. I'm hoping and I feel so bad and terrible for, for the theater actors. And of course, those theater actors are going to try to make the transition into film acting. And, you know, there's some good ones there. So the competition is, well, I mm -hmm. say the, 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 the talent pool has gotten even broader. So it's going to be a point. real big challenge for mm -hmm. all actors to, to keep working and to keep, and the health insurance, that's all changed. And right. although they, they say that, you know, the, the health insurance, um, the, the SAG, and the SAG doesn't, the union doesn't, after doesn't have anything to do with it. It's the, uh, you know, the pension health is a different entity. Let's face it. You know, Rob, it's, they're not making, no one's contributing anything to the, through the, through the production houses and the producers, which goes to the, to the, to the health insurance. And that's all changed because of that. Let's, mm -hmm. let's be honest. They can say what they want to say, but, and I okay. understand it. I mean, you know, so anyway, okay. that's what I think uh, eventually it'll get back, but vaccine. Okay. My special guest on Guys Guys Radio, the incredible Robert Fernero, um, multi-talented, multifaceted theater, TV, film, and now cooking. Tell us where we can find out about Eat With and when that's going to be on and how frequently you're going to be posting. Uh, Eat With, you can go to the website, Eat With website, look for uh, my experiences, Robert, put in Robert Fernero on Eat With and and uh, just plug my name into the website and you'll see the secret of the Sunday sauce and uh, you can register. Uh, we, the registrations are from two to eight people. It's, you know, right now it's an experiment. Uh, you know, I'm hoping that uh, Rob, that maybe, uh, and I was talking to Andrew and uh, Andrew Frank and uh, Andrew's uh, pro you know, production company that eventually maybe we can kind of, uh, put together some sort of show, have you on it? <laughs> I'd love and, it. Uh, maybe, you know, you know, Ray Romano and, and a lot of other people, I'm not saying it's going to happen to me because I don't know, who knows what's going to happen next. But I, I've seen a lot of comedians do something that they truly, truly love. But Ray started talking about his family and the kids. He had some children and it was some funny stuff. To me, food is, has a lot of humor and has yep. a lot of great stories. And who knows where it can go to? Maybe we can do a show out of it, you know, that show with uh, love in your heart, you know. It goes that. someplace. Maybe like being there, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Who knows? Well, i got to tell you, Robert, it's been an honor to meet you. You're a, you're a regular guy. You're a guy's guy, and you're a good man. And right. um, I'm going to follow your career. I hope everybody else does. And thank you for being here on Guys Guys Radio. Thank you, Robert. And I appreciate the, your time, and uh, I appreciate what you do. And Thank you. God bless. We're here to help. Thank you. You too. Robert Manny's The Guy's Guy's Guide to Love is a fast-paced tale of flawed men and savvy women competing for love, sex, power, and money in the city where they play for keeps. It's the men's successor to Sex in the City. The Guy's Guy's Guide to Love is a sexy romp through the fast-moving, high-stakes world of Madison Avenue. Available now on Amazon and wherever books are sold. Okay, that was a great, fun conversation with actor extraordinaire Robert Fernero. I hope you check out his uh, cooking lessons on Eat With. 
dot com uh, all over the internet he's going to give a lot of lessons on uh, italian food and beyond that i believe but uh if you go on his instagram uh, account you can see lots of photos of really tremendous looking food so what did we learn today from robert on guys guys radio let's start with the cooking we learned that if you want to get the best eggplant for your eggplant parmesan pick the small ones that's what that was his tip so let's keep that in mind when we're picking our eggplants i love eggplant parmesan we also learned that uh, James Gandolfini, the uh, actor who played Tony Soprano, who we all know from The Sopranos, he was an amazing guy in real life. I met him, and he was a very cool dude, and everybody from The Sopranos sings his praises and how he was a real leader, not just in the story line, but also uh, among the cast members, that he was very generous and very helpful and very supportive, and, and that's good to know. He was a really cool guy, and... Uh, it was sad he's gone, but the legacy that he has put behind him really is going to live on for a long time because The Sopranos now, it's up there with, uh, con in consideration with maybe one of the greatest, if not the greatest TV shows of all time. So uh, thank you, Robert Fernero, for being on the show and sa sharing your stories. We're here on Guys Guys Radio every Wednesday evening at 8 p.m. Pacific Time, 102.3, 106.5 FM, 1050 AM. The show rebroadcasts here in Southern California every Sunday evening at 6 p.m. Pacific Time. The podcast drops worldwide every Thursday. We are all over the place. We are on iHeartRadio, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Play, Spreaker, Stitcher, Deezer, CastBox, Podchaser, TuneIn Radio, Blog Talk Radio, um, you can stream it on kcaa.com. Also, my website, Robert Manny, M A N N I.com. I'll get more about that in a moment. But also, uh, YouTube. I have a new YouTube channel. Uh, you just look up Robert Manny, M A N N I, and it'll take you to what's called Guys Guys TV, where we have a section called Best of Guys Guys Radio, and we've got about 50 of the shows that are posted on there. So if you consume your podcasts on YouTube, well, there you go. So what else is going on? Um, on my website, robertmanny.com, you can also check out over 350 blog posts about everything from life, love, and the pursuit of happiness through my kind of guy's guy lens, if you will. And you can also download three free chapters from my novel, The Guy's Guy's Guide to Love, about two guys in advertising competing for love, sex, power, and money in the market where they play for keeps in New York City. It's a fun sexy romp it's a rom-com it's got strong women and flawed men and it's a, it's kind of like sex in the city meets entourage but with a business undertow and a spiritual underpinning if you can imagine all that but we've gotten fantastic reviews the guys guys guide to love it's been called the male successor to sex in the city so i hope you can check that out if you want to support our show you can rate us, review us, subscribe on iTunes slash Apple Podcasts. You can follow me on social media. I'm all over the place. Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and again, YouTube, uh, Guys Guys TV there. And I want to send a shout out to my trusty producers, Chris Marcello and Ryan Gilpatrick. They're fantastic, and they really are the engine that make things go on Guys Guys Radio. So I am very appreciative of them. I'm very appreciative of you, my audience and all my wonderful guests, and I do my very best to bring you guests that are going to share their journeys, their stories, and hopefully they'll share some information that'll help you out, and you'll be able to integrate some of that into your day-to-day -day life, or just say, hey, I was entertained, or that guy's fun, or made me think about something uh, beyond the usual stuff that's being, you know, sent our way, <laughs> the fear all of the attacks that we get from the mainstream media, you know, they're doing their job, but it's just, it's too much sometimes. And I've, I've been consuming less and less of that over time because it's just, it just puts me down. Uh, it makes me feel depressed uh, just listening to it. But you, you need to stay informed, of course, but it's just a bit too much at times. So anyhow, that's why we're here on Guys Guys Radio to give you kind of a, I don't want to say an alternative perspective, but I'm going to say an incremental perspective of some things where you might think about on your own, but might add some value to how you're going through your life on a day-to-day -day basis. So that's why we're here on Guys Guys Radio. Thanks for being with me. Uh, look forward to next week. We've got another great show coming up. And until then, like I always like to say, guys, guys, finish first. <laughs>